Defining beauty in China, now this is thoughtful. Hello, I'm Kitty Bu in Shanghai. The characteristics of beauty and interpretations of what makes someone beautiful change over time and across borders. Poets and politicians have debated the concept of beauty throughout recorded history. Today in China, meanwhile, is debated by the fashion and beauty industries, which are struggling to keep up with local trends. This week on Thoughtful China, we'll look at how Chinese define beauty, what women here think makes them beautiful, and the impact of foreign beauty advertising. And our own PT Black will give a historical perspective on the role of beauty in China. But first with us is Dave McCoggan, Senior VP and Regional Director of Strategic Planning, Asia Pacific, McCann Erickson Worldwide. Dave, thanks for coming back to our show today. Um, China's industry, beauty industry is booming. And um, how are beauty and style different unique to this market? I mean, how is it different, say, compared to Japan or the West or Southeast Asia? Well, one of the things we've been looking at is the way in which beauty develops in different countries. So if you consider recent history, say the last 30 years or so, the Chinese experience has been so different from the West and different again from uh, Japan. You know, China in terms of beauty development and the beauty industry, 30 years ago, it was very, very basic and there wasn't much available. Uh, women didn't have a very deep knowledge of modern cosmetics, modern skincare products. They weren't on the marketplace. So what you see is that today's generation of young women in China are really, if you like, pioneers in the whole world of application and usage of these types of products. Whereas in, say, in America, it's much more a much longer 100-year history. And so young women in those marketplaces are really just the latest evolution of what's been going on with their mothers and their grandmothers. That's one key factor in terms of the difference. The other thing is that we've noticed in our research that if you look at very fast growing developing marketplaces that are moving from underdeveloped or developing marketplaces through to the modern world in a fast way in the last 20 years, that beauty is really being seen as an edge and much more openly than perhaps you would find in big western markets. Young women in China will talk about that edge being really important and so they're much more open about the fact that I, I want to be beautiful or I want to use beauty in a particular way because I think it will get me the job. It will get me you know, an, a, a salary rise, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the other big differences, for example, is why do you think beauty is important? Um, or what really changes your beauty regime? So for example, in Western markets and more traditional markets, what we found is that women will most likely say, well, I changed my beauty regime in reaction to losing a boyfriend or trying to get a new boyfriend or losing my husband or trying to keep my husband. So it's always about very much about my personal relationships. And the crisis points in personal relationships are the moments when I think about getting a hair dye change or maybe I need a facelift or maybe I need to change my lipstick or whatever. In China, the, most, the biggest priority, the most common reason for changing my cosmetic behaviour or my beauty behaviour was going for a new job or trying to get a salary rise, or trying to impress my co-workers, or trying to impress my clients. So it really was much more about career and, and what I'm going to do personally, as opposed to how I'm going to interact with my, uh, or get a, a partner, if you like. And what does this mean for cosmetic companies? Uh, I think one of the things that we're finding is that around the world, cosmetic companies, especially the major players, whether they're major global or regional players, have to constantly relook at the way in which different marketplaces are thinking. And it gets down to really what the outtake of beauty is really about. So, you know, applying that lipstick or mascara, get, doing your hair in a certain way, the clothes you wear, are all part of social trends and they're all about me trying to fit in. So in China, while there may not be one single look, there are a number of mainstream sort of looks and movements. and. Women want to fit in with those, but then sort of stand out a little bit within that overall look. Well, that's common everywhere. What's really important for a cosmetics company, for example, is to figure out how their particular product is going to help women achieve what it is that they want in life. 
And what they want is more than just the look, it's what the look will get them. Exactly. And this brings us back to, are you doing it to win a guy or are you winning it to win a job or are you winning it to stand out in the crowd or are you winning it because I want to fit in with a certain movement, etc. What are the advantages of being beautiful in China? Well, quite clearly, the advantages of beauty are related to personal success. Um, they're related to how am I going to get a bit further, a bit faster? And so if you think about it, the nature of beauty itself has always been about how to be successful. Now, in more traditional cultures, a woman's beauty was always uh, a way in which to attract the right partner. In China and in also in some other developing countries in Asia, where whether through a one-child policy or uh, you know social policies, we have many more young single women who are really reliant upon themselves to be successful and are driven to get somewhere very fast. They are using beauty as an edge and, and that edge will be something that they can actually measure against their friends, uh, against the general marketplace, against women across the board. And that's why, for example, they'll be very, very heavy users of things like uh, blogs, uh, social media platforms, as well as magazines, because they're actually study tools, if you like. And one of the things we sometimes forget about the way in which we talk about consumers using media, and we sometimes forget that, you know, particular industries, the media people use are textbooks. Uh, and it's just like studying. So if you think about this young generation of Chinese women who have grown up in a very competitive educational world, academic world, um, trying to get into the right university, trying to get the right degree, trying to get the right job, they're going through exactly the same process. But instead of you know, physics textbooks or, or textbooks about how to learn English, it's about textbooks about beauty. It's the same process. Thank you for coming back to our show, Dave. Thank you. Now we'll hear from P.D. Black with a thought or two about how beauty has been defined in China historically. All kids in China learn about history's classic beauties, four ladies who have inspired millennia of poems and artwork. But here's the catch. We don't know what they looked like. We barely know what anyone their era looked like. In the classical tradition, beauties are identified not by their specific features, but by how others react to them. A typical description would go something like, Miss Diao Chan is so beautiful, the moon is ashamed to show itself. Miss Yang Yu Huan makes the flowers hide. More recent literature relies on comparisons. Eyebrows like silkworms, skin like jade, fingers like scallions. Art history doesn't help much. While Romans were carving detailed sculptures, China was painting in a highly stylized, two-dimensional style. Elegant, yes. Hot, maybe not. Tastes have also changed. The Tang Dynasty appreciated flesh, while later eras preferred their ladies slender. That appreciation for elegant fragility turned into a fetish for tiny feet and mincing steps, leading to bound feet, or three-inch golden lotuses. Incidentally, the Manchus in power during the Qing Dynasty rejected foot binding as being impractical and ridiculous. Their women achieved the distinctive totter by wearing platform shoes. As for the face and skin, Archival photos from late imperial families do provide a bit more detail. These are princesses and concubines. As the emperor's chosen, they're assumed to be the greatest beauties of their time, yet somehow the photos don't live up to expectation. They do have classic beauty. Small red mouth, big eyes, small nose, white skin. Getting that look is a full-time job. It starts with good genes, but needs gentle skin care, good cosmetics, and lots of sun protection. Not to mention good diet and emotional stability, both of which are needed to help keep skin blemish-free. Is it work? Yes. Is it a business opportunity? Certainly. Is it worth it? That's for the ladies to decide. Thanks, PT. With me now is Sabrina Liu, Head of Sales and Marketing at Swilling Group, Alison Mary Chen Yun, the Founder and Creative Director of the Mary Chen brand, and Charles de Poibon, CEO of the St. Pierre Poibon Lee and Associates Consultancy, and a former executive at L'Oreal China. Welcome to our show. During Mao's era, everybody wore the same clothes, same style, same color, but China nowadays is very different. D what do you think Chinese people are doing now? Do you think they're simply latching on to, uh, to Western style because it's the most obvious? or do you think they went to another extreme of self-expression because they're kept on a short leash for so long? I think that's a really uh, good question and I think your, uh, your, your questioning with the self-expression is very relevant. 
I, I think uh, if you look at just the um, industry alone, it's the fourth largest industry today, I think, following um, uh, tourism, automobile and real estate. So I think that's a, that's a telling sto story in um, the importance it plays in today's society. And I think this self-expression is so important because I think it is time for them to have the freedom and um, experiment and find their own ways. I think that beauty's always been something extremely important in Chinese culture. So, so, so Mao sort of hid that part for a certain period of time. So it's just, I wouldn't say it's just going back, back to beauty being in the forefront and, and certainly not to eventually a vision of what beauty was before with bound feet, but um, beauty is uh, important in Chinese culture. So it, it's just becoming, bringing it back to the forefront. The other thing I would say is, I, I'm not quite sure it's, it's a Western conception of, of beauty, because if you look at what um, Chinese believe is beautiful, you know, it's the small nose, the big eyes, the cherry lips, and the, the, the white, and the double eyelids and the white skin. So there is a, a, a very um, sort of codified view of what beauty looks like. It, and to a certain extent, it, it reminds me of what America went, has gone through in terms of beauty, not because it's exactly the same, but because it's codified. It's a Greek version of beauty. So when, you know, plastic surgery in the United States, people say they all look alike. It's because it's all based on, on uh, a view of beauty, which is Greek-based. Now you've got, you know, code of behavior or code of beauty in China, which is the one that I just described. So I think it's, it's, it's beauty has just come back naturally to the forefront in, in a version of beauty that is true to China to a certain extent. Yeah, and I think, I think that leads us on to the next point, which is, you know, beauty is, is about your inner beauty as well. Mm -hmm. It's not just about the outside. Yeah. So that's part of this involvement and people understanding that you don't have to fit the status quo to be considered beautiful, but beauty can be within, beauty can be a sense of um, empowerment, a sense of achievement, a sense of, you know, I'm worth it, mm -hmm. using yeah. a little bit of a slogan. Um, a cosmetics company, but um, you know, I think um, that's also an interesting topic in, in terms of how beauty is seen and understood here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. Especially, I think girls need to be, you know, perceived a little bit conservative mm -hmm. and well behaved and following men and then very gentle, act very gently. That can be called beauty and very good manner, in good manner. But nowadays, you see that even for the advertising, for the slogans for, for those brands, how they how they try to promote the beauties. That's like, you yourself is a legend, right? And then- That's a good say, motto, yeah, that's right. a good slogan. <laughs> You're a legend. <laughs> yeah, something like this. A lot of slogans like this for beauty brands. So um, Chinese girls just like to express themselves, be confident, show whatever you are, and then that's the beauty. Well, that's true. Actually, foreign companies have also helped broaden the idea of Chinese beauty by promoting more than just one traditional look. So what's beautiful here might not be beautiful somewhere else. Well, there's a saying in the West that women don't dress for men. They dress to impress other women. Is it the same in China? To me, I think um, in China, this is not the case. Mm -hmm. Chinese people has a saying, that means girls usually dressed for the one that pleases her or makes her happy. So uh, this is, has a long history about this kind of concept. So that's why most of girls, even now up to today, people still dress up and make up for the one that he, she loves and that the, for the one that makes her happy. So um, I would say that um, in this part, uh, more chi Chinese girls are still quite traditional. Uh, now we have a question from one of our Weibo followers. This is actually from Honey Honey. Why do the Chinese th usually think that foreign beauty is better than Chinese beauty? Because um, uh, I think anyway, beauty doesn't have any comparison like which one is better, which one is not. Mm -hmm. uh, just as we just mentioned at the beginning, actually, it takes all kinds to make a world and beauty has different types. So um, Chinese beauty, especially I would be proud to be Chinese because I think Chinese beauty is quite special and quite different. Just like Western uh, beauty, the same. We just have different characteristics, that's it. But I don't think that Chinese beauty is lower or less 
built for the West. You might, you, might, so, you, might, you might even say that right now it's, you know, in the fashion shows in Europe and things like that, I mean, China is it right now. I mean, they're introducing Chinese models everywhere. And I think, okay, it might be partly financially driven, but it's also because you know, you're getting more and more beautiful Chinese women, I think, today. Yeah, for example, some foreign uh, designers are even borrowing Chinese traditional ideas as part of their design. Well, I know, Sabrina, you personally probably don't agree with this, but uh, what do you think? I mean, do you think for some Chinese, maybe they think that foreign beauty is better than Chinese beauty? I think absolutely, of course. Um, but why do they think Western beauty products are better? It's because they've probably been brainwashed by extensive marketing campaigns and messages that are blitzing their brains out, that they, th they, you know, they, 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 they're taught to think that Western products are better. That, you know, at the end of the day, a cream is a cream, right? You might add a, a little bit of perfume and a little bit of oil and a little bit of, you know, fat, this, 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 but you know, <laughs> it does its job, right? Slightly disagree. <laughs> no, but I mean, it fundamentally does its I, job, I would, right? I would slightly disagree. Well, yeah. if you want to just simplify everything, so they're all selling the same products. It's just they're selling it in a different manner. So, you know, I think... <laughs> I think Charles really... <laughs> I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily disagree because, I mean, I, I, yes, I, I mean, I, I, for, having worked, for having worked for a cosmetics company for a number of years, I can say that there is real differences between products. And, and, and actually, you do see sales going up when you have effective <laughs> products. So at some points, consumers really look for <laughs> effectiveness. And it's one of the things that you see in, in Chinese consumers. They're not, very, they're not necessarily very loyal to, to, to brands because they're looking for product effectiveness. Uh, not, but you know, the problem with Chinese brands is up to now, they haven't been that, that good. And, That's and, my and, point. And, and, but, now they're, but now they're, <laughs> but now they're becoming Chinese, better. But now exactly. they're becoming better. If yeah. you know, you know her. size being bought by L'Oreal, right? <laughs> Isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So now they can invest millions into her marketing campaigns. Chinese might think that Chinese brands are better. You know. No, but it's already starting. Exactly. In the in the sort of uh, mid to to to. to <laughs> Well, yeah, accessible, let's, I'll, I'll, I'll accessible you're, getting, you're getting a lot yeah, of Chinese exactly. brands that are coming I'll, I'll in with uh, traditional Chinese medicine take on things, and, but they're good. Yeah. They're good. They're good. They're good at what they do, and their message, and their message talks to people. And I think that that's a, that's a challenge with you know emerging Chinese brands. But that's what happened in Japan and Korea. I mean, you know, in, in, in Korea, they, you know, Korean brands have done unbelievably well. In Japan, you know, L'Oreal has spent years and years trying to, 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 to get a significant market share comparable to some of the Japanese groups, and it's been very, very difficult. Um, here today, I, I think the problem is, is there isn't really the right Chinese competitive brands, which are, but they're starting to come into place. Yeah. And I mean, I, I just like to add, to that, to answer your question bluntly, I think um, <laughs> more bluntly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you were pretty blunt all the way through. I think um, I think the statement is true, but I think that it depends on wh who you're talking about, and I think it depends on the audience. So I think you know to be to be blunt, I think the less educated consumers are sustained to this illusion that Western brands are better because they're not educated to form their own opinions and to question. Their, their decision. Charles, Allison, Sabrina, thank you for being on Thoughtful China. Don't forget, Thoughtful China and Advertising Age are organizing Market to Watch, a conference about marketing in China's lower tiers in Shanghai on September 5th. And for the first time, Ad Age will bring its Women to Watch Awards to China with an awards dinner held on the same day. We hope you'll join us in honoring some of the marketing industry's most promising female professionals. Further details are available now on adage.com and thoughtfulchina.com. That wraps it up for today. Be sure to subscribe to us on Tudo and YouTube. You can also follow us on Weibo and Twitter and join our LinkedIn group. See you again.